that seems ominous. The content of this meeting is being sent to a third party. <laughs> Who are you snitching to, Ted? <laughs> oh, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I got you. All right. Popping out the chat and saying hi. I uh, want to remind people to ask questions. So I'll type that out there, too. Um, And I want to tell people that we are going to do an episode today where we kind of go out into the field and we look at things. All right. So we're going to look at what is, you know, kind of ranking. Because right now, you know, Google's doing a massive update. People are screaming the sky is falling. Uh, Google sent out some messaging saying that uh, table of contents links are bad and FAQs are bad because they're show Google signals. Um, so I, I think it's time that we kind of look at the current state of Google. What do you think of this topic, Lee? I think it's always fun to look and see if there's validation in the SERPs for the proclamations. Okay, so we'll we'll take a look and we'll consider if what we're doing as SEOs is more or less ridiculous than what Google is choosing to rank. <laughs> so you can kind of get a feel for how this is probably going to go. <laughs> but all right, um, let's uh, get through the boilerplate. Don't forget Magic PR. Uh, so if you need press releases, uh, we like press releases. All legitimate businesses do press releases. Even Google does press releases. Uh, so that's a good thing to consider. Be sure to reach out to the experts and ask them how they do it, how to do it safely, what they need. Tell them what your objectives are. You know, the, the people in uh, the press release industry, they're, they're happy to give you their best insights. So just get multiple opinions and then figure out a plan that works for you. All right, uh, SEO spring training, kind of the last chance. Uh, you know, if you want to get in on it, it's down to the wire. They're nearly sold out on um, everything is my understanding. So I would not wait. And you're out of time if you wanted to wait. So uh, be sure to consider it kind of down to the wire on that. All right, so with that, we're going straight into let's look at Google mode. All right, let's kind of maximize this, and you'll understand why I'm maximizing the height here in a bit. Real quick, Ted, uh, because next week is spring training, uh, are we having a Fight Club episode? Oh, I, I, you're on I, vacation, and Charles is traveling, I think, that day, and I'm traveling, I think, that day, so... Yeah, I think next week we won't uh, be here. Uh, we'll see you yeah. the week after. So that's a good call. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's look at our first keyword. All right. So we're going here, pasting it in. How to rank a blog on Google. Now, why I chose this keyword was because Google's claims were about SEO activity and showing signals to Google for the purpose of ranking. And I think this is clearly a keyword that would be handled by SEOs clearly for the purpose of ranking. So any uh, criticism on my keyword choice no i mean it's it's just straightforward uh you know it's it's right up there with you know google ranking factors or <laughs> seo near me you know these sort of terms yeah yeah exactly all right so the first thing we get is a featured snippet all right and the thing about featured snippets is you can't include them in the algorithm analysis because a different algorithm can pick these from as far down as like page three page four a lot of seo tools consider this position zero for the purpose of content analysis but if this happened to come from page four, it doesn't have page one content. So if you analyze it as it's the 
trophy spot of content position, you're you're corrupting your data. So we're not going to look at featured snippets, different algorithm, different problem. So we're going to go past featured snippets. We're going to go past any other blended search engines like people also ask, local map pack, ad search. And so here we get to one. All right. So let's see what number one did to get to number one. And that's fairly recent. That's November 24th. So, you know, it's not, you know, content that was written years ago. It's. All right. So this one looks uh -oh. kind of straightforward. They do have uh, supplemental content accordions. And table of contents up there on the right. Up there. Oh, yeah. TOC. Yep. Ranking number one. All right, and let's let's kind of quantify this. So uh, my monitor is about a foot tall. Uh, so, you know, it's plus or minus an inch or so in margin of error. But I'm going to page down and let's kind of estimate linear feet of vertical scrolling. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 15 and, and a half. Not bad. 15 and a half feet. But I think we can do better. All right. Let's see. Let's go to this one. I like All that right. one. Studies that have a blog. How to rank blog on Google. All right. Whoa, Nelly. I can see by the scroll bar. Uh, percentage up up here in the corner it shows you how much this the window screen is and the paging this is going to be a long one <laughs> mm -hmm. all right let's check out the linear feet here all right so we got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen <laughs> seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 40 in a fraction, 40 feet of vertical scrolling. Now, what's interesting about that is at about 24, you started to hit comments. So I mean, yeah. 24 feet of content and 16 feet of comments. Yeah, non-paginating, by the way. Like, you can paginate contents. That's easy. But these are all in line. And let's see. And they have thanks for the guidance on ranking of blog in search engines. <laughs> all right. Let's kind of view source on that. Sometimes there's some, sh or not view source, inspect. All right. So, how oh, and this is actually, back. if you look at the date of the comments, that's not the same as the uh, the date that showed in the SERP was November of 23. And these comments are back from 21. So, this is not a new one. This is a refreshed one. All right. All right, so it's not the worst. Uh, it's not the worst comment implementation I've ever seen. So they have text mentions in the comment itself. Sometimes when you look at non-paginating comments, they'll repeat the page topic in every comment automatically in the source code, and so you'll be getting three, four, or five keyword mentions per comment even though you may or may not have said it in the comment. And so that's what I was looking for. They weren't doing it. So this is just what you post is what you get style non-paginating comments. Mm -hmm. All right. But I still think we can do better. 
I, I'd be willing to bet there's something on page one that's, we'll call it egregious. If 40 linear feet of vertical uh, scrolling is okay, let's see if we can find the egregious. Google help. <laughs> Well, it auto zoomed for us. Let's see what uh, Google's doing here. Um, so they have related content. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in the Google Help. So let's see, related questions. So Cora and Google Help do the same supplemental content? Yeah, but those are all different questions. More related questions. So here they have related questions. Related questions. Related questions. <laughs> Yeah, while they're also showing other related questions, you know, in between the menus. And related questions. Right. All right. I don't think that wins on linear feet. Neil Patel. Come on, Neil. Oh, Neil delivers. <laughs> I was going to say that's that stack in the deck right there. Yeah, all right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five. 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, no comment section. Yeah. All right. Um, let's let's look at a different keyword. So we looked at one keyword, 44 feet, no comments was kind of the winner on that keyword. How to build backlinks. All right. So that's featured snippet stuff. So we got SEM Rush. Uh oh. All right. So we got a contender in spot one. All right. One, two. Yeah, three, it's a 15 minute three. read at the top of the article. <laughs> This counts as a foot. It's an overlay pop-up. I got 52 and a fraction, so I think we have a new reigning champ on linear feet of vertical scrolling. All right, back Linko. I think we have another contender here. Oh, yeah. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, Uh, around 110 to 115, somewhere in there. Um, so, yeah. 
hundred so, imagine that a hundred linear feet of vertical scrolling content it's interesting so we've got a little background noise because uh can you make sure everybody's muted on this and then the other thing as i watched it was about at 50 when it went from content to comments so you know it, it's right in the middle of the uh the scroll bars where it flopped over so it's like 50 uh feet of content and 60 feet of comments Yeah, 1,000 comments with no pagination. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, inspect. Yeah, and again, not the most egregious comment implementation. They aren't stuffing in the uh, in the boilerplate comment HTML. Um, so yeah, what you see is is what you get on the the comment tuning. But I mean, that's uh, that's incredible. All right. Mm -hmm. So this this is clearly one way to rank a page. And what it kind of means is that, well, honestly, a lot of what SEOs have been recommending about keyword density and scope of content and number of headings and, you know, this stuff is, is ranking for real keywords at the top currently so even after all of google's web spam updates and helpful content updates and this update and that core update this is still ranking and before the show i went and checked i went and looked at a rhinoplasty plano site that is still ranking for a different city and mm. it went up <laughs> it was number three it's now number two it went up after all these updates. Um, I went and looked at Clint Butler's uh, nothing but schema rank a blank page to number one for a real keyword. It's still number one. Mm -hmm. Still number one. All right. So I went and checked all my other this method, that method sites. Uh, there it's all the same so far. So the standard playbook of what's ranking is still the same playbook. There's just this aspect of Google is somehow picking people to pick on, whether that's manual or algorithmic, or maybe they have an algorithmic way of selecting their victims and then they manually penalize them. And that's how it works. So if we run this filter, we're going to hurt you manually and you have to get unhurt manually uh, because you met our, our filter definition. Um, something like that is happening here because we're not seeing fundamental forces change in the search engine. So if you have a model of SEO, if you have a theory of SEO science and this is what's in my model of SEO you need to account for the things we see on page one. You need to account for a web page that has a hundred linear feet of content and Google rank that number one. And when Google says table of contents links are a show Google signal and that's what hits you, how come we found them ranking at the top of page one for real keywords? So your model of SEO needs to explain page one. If your model can't explain what's appearing on page one, then there are gaps in that model. What do you think of that notion, Lee? Yeah, I agree. I mean, a lot of times when you hear, oh, you know, like, don't take your keyword density above 2%, and then you go and you just see, you know, example after example, you know, one of two things is true. Either that rule is not a rule, or 
it's a rule, but it can be overridden by something else. And what's the something else that allows them to get away with this clear violation of, you know, the rule. And, you know, that's, that's where most people, you know, fall short. They fall back on, well, when Google finds this backlinko article, they will penalize it. And I'm like, they, they penalized it up to number one, you know? It's, yeah. It's, and, it, and it's not new, like mm -hmm. for years, his blog was famous for having 40 posts. Like he did the bulk of his fame on a 40 post blog. And it's amazing. I don't want to take away from that. Like he did what, what millions could not with the blog that had 40 pages. And right. so that's a, a testament. That's another way to rank a website is the way he did it. And so we're not saying his method doesn't work. We're saying the opposite. In fact, it does work. And you need to account for why it worked in your theory of SEO. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's look at this again. So he, he has table of contents links. I don't know what Lee, what would be a good a good test keyword that would take us out of uh SEO context if we really wanted to test this notion of long form content but not in an SEO niche. Apple pie recipe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First, there's, nowhere a jump, near. there's a jump link right at the top. Jump to recipe. You can see that. <laughs> yeah, it's nowhere near as bad. I can tell by the scroll bar indicator. Um, man, is it crawling pop-ups, uh, video playing on uh, page load. Um, and this is pretty egregious advertising. Uh, it's not as bad as some we'll, we'll get you when you see results two three four we'll we'll find some affiliate links yep all right so just note this was number one for apple pie recipe and they have uh plainly visible amazon affiliate links just just letting you know Almost right at the top. Almost yeah. right at the top. Uh, so this is clearly allowed. It might be a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Embedded videos. Yeah. Boy, they're heavy on the ads, though. Hey, got to get paid. That's, you know, in this particular niche, in the recipe niche, this is how they get paid is with the ads. All right. Not too bad, but nowhere near 100 linear feet. No. Let's look at the next one. So this one claims to be a video. Look at the scroll bar. All right, let's <laughs> see for apple pie. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So about forty. So yep. that's the halfway point. Yep, and we haven't got to the recipe yet. I'm just telling you, these people will, you know, use thirty-five feet to talk about, you know why their grandmother picked those particular apples and then the, there's the recipe the historic uh, significance of apple pie <laughs> just in their household <laughs> they, don't, they don't go yeah there it is there was the recipe right there at the bottom yeah so, so you yeah. have to go through 38 feet of content to get to the recipe yeah you have to you know get carpal tunnel to, to figure out is this the recipe that I want? Do I have all these ingredients or know how to can you know hit control end on your keyboard? <laughs> Some do, yeah. Some don't still.
Not uh, finding a lot of black hat comments, though. That's an interesting pattern. Yep. Maybe that's a lost art. All right, let's look at a third example. Home cooking. Not that bad. So it's not going to win on linear feet. Went straight into comments, though. That's interesting. So yeah, this is a... Let's, let's continue to recipe. That's an ad. That's, that's a clickbaity, you know, ad. This almost looks black hat. Yeah, it's nothing but comments. So it's like a discussion group or something. <laughs> Advertisement. Continue. like and you wonder how you got malware hmm. yeah there you go all recipes they're a good one yeah not the most linear feet what they <laughs> no you've got ads and pop-ups so already you know videos Is that like 30, 40 percent of the of the content there is just ads on the right yeah. hand? Yeah, and, and right you could round. go at the bottom of the comments, you could load more, load more comments or load more reviews. Well, that got removed right when it started auto playing. That must have been like an auto detected violation of multiple video ads playing. Or overlapping, maybe. Yep. And you can see the the inner uh, interlinking to the other pie or some of the other pie recipes that they have. Yeah, this ad used too many resources for your device. So, oh, so Chrome intervened. That's interesting. I didn't know Chrome would do that. Yeah. Also telling you if your password been compromised. Yeah. This one's pretty long. <laughs> what was it the top again? All right. So at least they get right to it. Yeah, so far this one feels like the most sincere I'm trying to share a recipe example. Mm hmm Yep. Oh, what's happening here? Well, Pioneer Woman Redrummond, she makes her money off of sale of her own stuff. Yeah, she has she has a TV show, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, and she has lines of cookware and all sorts of other things. All right, Books. well, she... She wins the prize of most legitimate recipe site on page one. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> All right. Recipe 10 eats. Oh, this is a long one. This might be a winner. One, two, three. That's about halfway. So 44, 45 feet. It's a lot of instructions. Was that all recipe steps? All right, so sweaters. So yeah, because Charles, back in back in the day when you were doing some of the the cooking, it's all about the sweater, is it not? Uh, indeed, I was just thinking. So, uh, little known fact for folks: I actually went to culinary school, and I don't think. We ever spent this much content on a single recipe ever? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, like our books would have been, we would have had like twenty books if, if we I, did that. I do appreciate that at the start of the recipe, they spell out, "Here's how you're going to mess up this pie." Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, as as a an amateur baker at best, uh, 
that's this is good content here like i don't know what google thinks of it but as in a total amateur at baking this is good content well if you're if you're looking just at this section just right here for keywords and entities it's like every other word that's the beautiful thing about you know pie recipes and you know recipes in general is that you know all the ingredients are topically related the monster. Oh. Then the ghost. Uh oh. Are you so? <laughs> there we go. Um. All right. And so, let's see. So the crust. Yeah. Then they go into extreme detail on everything, which is probably good for amateurs like me. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, can you do a find and just type the word Apple and see how many times Apple appears on the page? And then the same thing in the code. Yeah. So we got 176 in the visible content. And then we view source, line wrap, find uh, 500 uh in the source so 176 out of 500 are visible to traffic yeah so again you don't want to use your keyword too many times <laughs> yeah yeah so they have they have uh keywords and scripts they have keywords and meta tags uh open graph images i can see Twitter apple pie 8 jpeg so that means yeah, they're gonna yeah. Their open graph image image names, um, and uh, they're not using a CDN. That's interesting. Um, their title is remarkably short. That's interesting. Meta description, extensive schema. And so JSON LD, all right. So this is what Clint and Terry Samuels say. Hey, you need to get really verbose in your schema. All these matches you're seeing here are in the JSON LD. Mm -hmm. All right. There's the end script tag right here on the JSON LD. So that how does your Yoast. schema look? <laughs> yeah, and that was just Yoast, which, you know, Yoast does not do anywhere near what Clint and Terry do. Yep. All right, so then they have their RSS feeds. So they're syndicating, and you got to be careful if you're not an expert at syndication because you can destroy your SEO if you syndicate without knowing what you're doing. Uh, this is typically how other people... Uh, show Google your content before Google sees it on your site. <laughs> and so technically they're first to internet with it because you don't know what you're doing with syndication. So be very careful with your RSS settings and WordPress. And people go nuts. They say, they stole my content. No, they didn't. You turned on syndication and they syndicated it because you asked them to. <laughs> So it's not stolen if you don't know what the setting does. So learn what that setting does. Um. All right. Yeah, pull down to that dense brown block over there on the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get through the desert. And so here we are in a div. This is in an, R, an ARIA label. So they're... Their accessibility features are repeating keywords. Uh, their headings, that's an H1. Uh, their Facebook URLs. <laughs> yeah, their image names, that's applepie8.jpg. So take note of the image names. Um, and not only that, this is an image with parameter variables, and one of the variables is a description equals and a repeat of the encoded keyword. Now, I don't know about you guys, but my image URLs do not require 
form parameters. <laughs> so that is a remarkable way of getting more keywords into a URL. So right there, that that is that is black hat. <laughs> that I I am proud of the person who said I'm gonna put unnecessary form parameters on an image link to get more keywords into a URL. <laughs> oh my right, god, that there. is awesome. See, <laughs> even even I, where I am at in my SEO journey can be surprised by what I find by just looking for outliers. I yeah. learned a new tactic today regarding image URLs and keyword stuffing. Yeah. Honey, it, honey said she was over there screenshotting this shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not the only one learning about new techniques. <laughs> All right. So, so that, that was awesome. All right. Kudos to your SEO. I'm impressed. All right, so they got them in the uh, folder structure. In sentences, people often, uh, they don't like to think about sentences, but sentences are quantifiable, you know? So you got to think about your sentence densities. I love that H2 right there. I love, love, love. That's That's a table of contents block where in the ID field, they've got, you know, a repetition of their optimized H2 tag. Yeah. So, yeah, they they didn't go all out because technically you could have put a title attribute to make the heading have a tool tip. So they could have got a legitimate third mention in there. Um, Let's see. Yep. Oh, now we're down to Apple Pie 9 dodge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's six. Yeah, there's all right. So this this is interesting. So this might be a clue as to uh it may be a happy coincidence. Uh there are systems out there where you can upload an asset and the image server for those assets can do dynamic transforms. So you can put in information and it becomes a transformed image like resizing or or adding captions or doing things and the image server will edit the and cache the image requirements and then show them there and so this could be a uh, utilization of one of those image servers that dynamically edits the image and so you could play around uh possibly play around with these URLs and see the edits. It depends, uh, it depends if they allow uh, cross origin, no refer. Um, but yeah, that's, there could be a way where they weren't brilliant black cats and it's just coincidental, but I don't know. It's very suspicious. And, and effective. And this particular, this is, uh, you know, recipe and eats. So th this is, there are, are several sites. There's probably about 20 or 30 of them that compete. You know, they've got hundreds and hundreds, thousands of recipes on their site that, you know, all have this long form content. They're all stuffed, you know, they all interlink. So, you know, you're dealing with authority site structures and it's an ads play. You know, that's how they make their money is monetizing via the ads. So they have to rank well. And so you see a lot of really good and innovative SEO in the space because nobody thinks that the recipe space is as competitive as like, you know, personal injury lawyer, but it's actually more competitive than those sort of spaces. It's almost as competitive as mesothelioma and some of those. Yeah, looks like a lot of the stuff repeats, and then yeah. uh, we kind of get down to the the footer. I think that's related stuff, and then probably footers. This little last one down here. Mm -hmm. Or no, that looks like what is that? That is a div, and it's data settings. So it's some sort of dynamic content thing. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, if all that stuff is still ranking top of page, then how much has the SEO playbook changed? And so I'm I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that it's changed. Now, I'm not denying that Google is dynamically figuring out targets to manually punish. I think that's totally happening. But in terms of like the algorithm being fundamentally different, it looks like big pages with keywords throughout is still working. It looks like TFIDF keyword density are on the right track as to what Google is actually positioning for relevancy. Uh, entity density looks like it's massively in play. And, you know, a lot of the things that Google says are, you know, bad signs, table of contents, links, supplemental content. And that's another thing. When they claim that those supplemental things are bad, why don't they update the quality raters guidelines? Why doesn't Google take the first step, go into the quality raters guidelines and say that supplemental content is evil? Because if they're not going to do that, then then they're talking out of both sides. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what I think is happening here is they're saying things that aren't backed by code. What do you think, Lee? Yeah, I, I, we've always talked about this. I think that the Google probably on some level aspires to have, you know, the best human readable content up there. But, you know, the the algorithms, you know, have to go off of simple rules and simple rules are, you know, always exploitable. So, you know, again, how is it possible that a lorem ipsum site of any type ranks, you know, if they were serious, but that's the that's one line of code to fix that problem, you know, universally. But they don't because there's you know, things that are hardwired into the, the ecosystem. And so, you know, when we go through the SERPs like this and see these particular things, you're like, ooh, that's not supposed to be working. Ooh, that's not supposed to be working. Ooh, that's not. But it does. And you see it. Yeah. And so and the, the, the pattern I've seen for decades now is that Google claims that they've fixed something or they threaten that they will fix it, and then they never fix it. And so that that's what we're seeing, Google, is you, you never back up the talk. So if you want to fix search, then fix it. You know, but we know, we all know that's a dumpster fire and the whole world's going to hate you when you do it. Uh, but, you know, here's the thing fix stuff like lorem ipsum shouldn't work white text on a white background shouldn't work if you have a rule about table of contents links then have a rule about table of contents links and enforce it because uh, if you're not gonna do it what should we all think So, and, and we know right now Google doesn't want to fix any of these issues. That's why they all take manual actions. So think about that for a second. Keyword stuffing is a manual action. It takes a human being on Google's side to find your page out of hundreds of trillions of pages and manually punish it because the algorithm can't do it. Yeah. And, and we've we've tested you know, we've tested keyword density all the way up to 95%. That is not hard to find. You know, it's not a hard set of code and um honey was back over here she goes and even when people report it Google doesn't do anything about it. And we have a number of people that have have done that. I mean, uh Chris Palmer uh took an idea it was just, you know, brilliant. I I built sites before trying to get them penalized. He built a site to try to get it penalized. And then he put malware on it 
And then he used several high authority Google guide accounts to report his own site and couldn't get it taken down. So, you know, you're breaking all the rules that you can think of and still ranking. Are they rules? I got nothing. You know. Yeah. I mean, what what else can you do? So when Google comes out and says table of contents links are bad, I recommend you go to search and see if they rank. And then I recommend you make a test page on a test site. See if it gets indexed. See if it ranks. You know, it pays to test because then you know who's lying to you. <laughs> You know, and, and that's the whole thing. And it it's like, you know, Lee and, and Clint and, and Kyle and myself and others, you know, we can test it for you, but then we're still just guru SEOs saying shit. So really the only way this ever works for you is if you figure out how to prove these things for yourself, because then no one can take that away. Um, so yeah, yeah. So Corey asked a question. He goes, how, how risky do you guess this future of supplemental content is? Are the bottom of page accordions time bombs? And I'm, I'm going to say, look, they can't figure out Laura Mipsum, you know, legitimate content at the bottom of a page is about as safe as it gets. You, yeah. You, you don't need to worry about it because the fix on it is so simple and Google would never be able to tell it apart. The fix on it would be to just fold it into the main content and do a hundred linear feet of vertical scrolling. Plus, well, there's a lot of very large websites that have accordions and tabbed content. Um, I can think of almost a dozen off the top of my head that I've seen. That, yeah. And there's nothing nefarious, but they're not trying to do anything cr tricky. They're just they're trying to, well, I assume they're not trying to do anything tricky, but it's, you know, it's a user experience play. And um, yeah, and Google talks about that in their search essentials. I was looking at that yesterday with somebody and I said, see here, they're talking about accordions and saying, that's fine. That's a great way of using that for user experience. And so, you know, if they're going to do that and then penalize it, like, wait a minute, I'm trying to do things the right thing for the user. And it's not there, but also in an accordion, you know, you could stuff Laura Mipsum content if you wanted to. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, and let's let's be real. When you have a hundred linear feet of vertical scrolling content, some of that content is in fact supplemental content that's being presented as main content. That's how you get to a hundred linear feet of content at a normal font size on a desktop browser. Yeah. All right, let's look at a few questions here. All right, if you have a question that you need answers for, now's your, your chance to ask. All right, so we are seeing a lot of backlinks to our images from spammy-looking websites. Uh, so you can actually configure your HT access to deny that, and I recommend that you do because then people can't remotely use your images. They... They could still download them, put them on their server, and then reference them, but they couldn't reference them off of your server. I recommend you do that. And if they're legitimately your images, I recommend that you copyright them because then you can really go after them legally if they're in the right jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions, it's harder. Yeah, DMCA um, takedowns are, are, are nasty. I think, you know, Charles, do you have any info on... <laughs> Just that's, how problematic they that's are. been my week and my day. Um, <laughs> so talking about penalties, like here's a great example. We have someone who's weaponized DMCA takedowns against us, and we're going to go after them legally. And, and I'm, it'll be interesting to see how Google responds. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how Google responds to it. Uh, let's see. How, how can we SEOs help organizations to cut costs? I already know that if we get them traffic, they pay less to ads and that higher 
uh, quality score lowers click cost. Um, well, there's a lot of efficiencies. Like if if typically when you make the page load times smaller, you're actually freeing up server resources so the same servers can accommodate more users. Uh, using things like CDNs uh, do a great job of that as well. Um, and efficient web development is another way you can uh, reduce uh, server load and then have increased traffic per server instance. Uh, that's a great way to reduce cost. Um, and then having streamlined workflows. When everybody in an organization understands the optimal way uh, to do something for, for the organization, so multi-business unit awareness, uh, then you can have people writing product copy who understand the SEO needs. You can have people who write or edit the articles understand the value of the keyword they're targeting and why there must be a target keyword for this document. Um, you know, getting that awareness out there is going to increase the efficiency and success of the entire business. And that's why uh, enterprise SEOs spend so much of their time on consensus building because uh, getting that knowledge shared helps the whole uh, organization succeed on all fronts. And SEO uh, typically benefits all other channel marketing. So like you mentioned, uh, you know, getting better SEO improves quality score and gets you better ad position at lower cost per click. But even still, you know, getting good SEO on your brand pages and your brand keywords, what do you think happens when there's a TV commercial or a billboard or a magazine ad? When those things are successful, they result in brand searches. People go to a search engine and type in what they remember from the ad, which is often the business name. Uh, sometimes it's the product name. Sometimes it's the type of product. And so you got to think about that. But those multi-channel marketing uh, uh, attempts typically result in keyword search. Uh, what do you think, Charles? Uh, yeah, no, the, one of the big things that we did was call deflection. So if you have a company that takes that has a product and gets lots of questions from people about the product, you should you can SEO around uh, all those issues, all those questions, and help to deflect calls that are coming into your company's support centers because that costs a lot of money. Um, same with questions around the sales, around anything that people would ask about a product. Maybe you have a product that has a longer sales cycle, so it's not just... I'm going on and buying this widget off Amazon. I want to know a lot about it. It's going to be a couple hundred dollars or more. Uh, make sure those answers are being those questions are being answered on the on the website uh, to to shorten the sales cycle. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things you can do. And don't forget, there are dumb reasons companies lose lots of money. And on a very high traffic website, I mean gigabytes of log files per per day on a very high traffic website, I saw that they had a Facebook icon of the Facebook thumbs up. And so I went and looked at that icon because it looks suspiciously slow in the waterfall. And so when I got that little tiny 16 by 16 pixel icon that had been dynamically resized, it was a 2000 by 2000 pixel image of a thumbs up so don't assume that people don't make dumb mistakes people make dumb mistakes all the time you know i also look at this i'm gonna i'm gonna go at this a little bit differently the in terms there's a lot of ways where this feeds into just the metrics of running a business and i'll, I'll use just a plumber a local plumber as an example you know if you've got two guys in the business, two plumbers, and they're both at, you know, 70% capacity, you know, getting more calls is a great way of doing that because then your, your, um, your payroll is distributed over, you know, a higher uh, revenue number. So you're effectively lowering your cost per, you know, serviced customer by doing that. On the other hand, if, you know, you've got the guys are running at a hundred percent, 
more SEO might actually push them. You need another person, you need another truck, you need more equipment. And those are capital costs that, you know, sometimes small businesses struggle with. Sometimes it's, you know, a matter of changing if you're near a capacity number instead of from general plumbing to the, you know, the higher dollar uh, things, you know, focus on those particular things. So you get the same revenue or higher revenue coming in, but, you know, you can handle it with the same capacity that you have with your, the, the resources inside the business. So, you know, cost cutting can, can look a lot of different ways, just depending on, you know, how the business is structured and what constraints they're running up against currently. And uh, one thing that a lot of businesses neglect, you can often uh, improve uh, the uh, load capacity of a server by 40, 50, 80 percent simply by giving a crap about negative SEO and hacking attempts. When you go through your web logs and you identify all the cross-site scripting, the SQL injection, all the negative SEO uh, bot traffic due to spammy link building, and you, you figure out all of those things, it can take a ton of load off of your servers, like a massive amount. You might find that your business is, is more spam and hackery than, than actual human beings. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, do YouTube embedded playlists on a web page increase keyword count better than a single embedded video on a web page? I don't know. Uh, I think you'd have to test that out. I don't imagine Google would punish it. I do imagine that Google understands the context of what's in that content. And so I would imagine in some way that adds some value to your page or website's context, but these aren't things I've uh, scientifically tested. Uh, what about you, Lee? Have you tested no. that? No, it's not something that I worry about because, you know, it's one of those things, if I can pull it in and I can see it in the HTML, you know, I know it's there. If they have to go through and render it based on the way you put something on a page, then, you know, even if it works, sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not when rendered indexing is offline. So, you know, you have to be aware of that as well. But I don't, I don't get into the nuance of does this tactic, you know, work better than that tactic? I'm just, you know, more in the uh, uh, looking at gross factors rather than just little nuanced stuff like that. Yeah, Mark says, I think it's sad that we all now have to say that's allowed related to different things on our own sites as if Google is the de facto internet. I wholeheartedly agree. And sadly, most people in the industry think I'm crazy when I even talk about it. But, you know, I remember the web before Google and you could do anything you wanted. It was truly free speech. You know, the, the culture of penalties that were steeped in, that was Google's contribution to the internet. And I don't think it's better. I mean, we used to have, you know, housewives, you know, running affiliate programs and bringing in decent affiliate income to help pay the bills. We had schools doing that too, and you don't see it anymore. You know, a, a lot of things we used to monetize, we used to monetize with ads and links on our own personal websites. And now that's against the rule. Only Google can monetize with ads and links on websites. If you do it, then that's bad. And why is it bad? Well, it competes with Google's ad platform. That's why it's bad. Um, so, yeah, we used to have a lot more freedoms and what we could do. And people are saying, well, you can still technically do it. There's no law. But yeah, if Google delists your website, I mean, that's painful. So are you free or can Google punish you? You know, so yeah, I, I hear you. I agree with you. The The web was better before Google. Um, I made more money after Google, but you know, the web and freedom suffered to make that money. Uh, let's see. First Apple uh, you showed had 161 comments. Uh, 
let's see somebody says apple pie sounds yummy lee reynolds says this is too funny and let's see business growth ready uh recipe pages look to have lots of social shares yeah that's a good point um yeah uh 14 000 shares in the pages from 2021 uh, yeah, I'd imagine that lots of people that are looking for content about baking would share what they find. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're looking for social media marketing, you know, recipe stuff is really good. Pet related stuff is really good. Um, can you elaborate on RSS and impact on SEO? So, yeah, your WordPress has this RSS checkbox. And I, I know in the past it was on by default. I don't know if latest versions of WordPress have it on by default. And it would syndicate your website to anybody who was looking for content to borrow. And so you would put out an RSS feed that says, hey, I'm authorizing this content to be borrowed on other websites. And what you would typically get back from that is backlinks. So RSS feeds were a great way to build up uh, referring domains and backlinks, but it came at the price of having unique content because now the content you wrote is being shared in part or in whole on other people's websites. And so now you no longer have unique content. When Google sees the same content on multiple websites, it'll typically award the higher page rank page to be the winner, the de facto winner in the search result. And that isn't always the original author. And the other problem is Google does give uh, some authority to whoever posts the content first. But that's a process of Googlebot visiting websites and doing discovery dates on when they find it. So if they find it on the other site before they find it on your site, then they have the earlier date in the database. So there are multiple ways this can blow up in your face. Uh, the people that uh, use RSS effectively, they only use small summaries. And in this day and age, you should probably author a plugin that will rewrite the content using AI. So you're syndicating a rewrite to get the backlink. Um, and so I would also only use them uh, temporarily. At a certain point, you will outgrow the need for that type of link building. And then you turn it off and going forward, your only unique content on the site. So if it's a new site, you RSS for a bit to get backlinks, knowing you won't have unique content, then you turn it off and do unique content only. Uh, but people, they just turn it on and forget about it or turn it on and don't know what it is. And then they find all these sites out there that look kind of spammy. They stole my content. No, you didn't understand the checkbox. So you need to go in and undo the checkbox if you think they're stealing your content. Now, sometimes content theft does happen legitimately. Uh, scraper sites are stealing the content. RSS sites are not. They're simply posting what you pushed out for syndication. Uh, any thoughts on RSS, Lee? No, but I think you know the 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 scraper stuff is is true because I've had uh, tests ruined by scrapers discovering you know uh, Lauren Ipsum videos on YouTube or something like that and posting them out. It's like, okay, well now this video's got fifty you know embeds uh, across the thing that kind of distorts the results that you can get. I hated that. I was, admired it a little bit because that's that's some you know. Uh, that's some effort there that goes into these sort of things. But when they came across my test sites, I didn't appreciate it much. And if they were stealing, you know, my legitimate content, I'd be, you know, upset. 
Yeah, a business growth ready says you can limit the RSS to excerpt plus link, but the excerpt is usually the H1 in the leading paragraph. So most damaging. The other thing is there used to be a tactic around this particular thing where, you know, you'd go and find, I'd, I'd launch a, a website on, you know, Apple Pie recipes and I'd go find a bunch of page rank one sites and use their RSS feeds to scrape and post to, you know, to your site. And then you'd get, start to get that authority. And then you'd move up to page rank, you know, two or three, and then you could just, you know, keep eating the, the uh, articles in the page rank below you to move on up and build authority, having never written a single line of content yourself. You know, it was, it was a problem for a while because, you know, the, you know, you can imagine what would happen if uh, Fox news, you know, has a uh, Google bot living on that site. And if they republished an article on Lee's baking blog on there, they're going to get found first, you know, and they're going to have more authority behind, uh, behind that. So, you know. And uh, since we have Madge here, anything new? How are the new developments working out? Uh, the new homepage has just gone live. <laughs> well, your show going. Um, right. And look sharp. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the new service was launched in January, uh, but we're trialing it with a few clients of ours. Um, it's a full, full on 60 day digital PR campaign that we do. Uh, we create the PR angles for our clients. They give their feedback as in what they want us to do. And then we touch base with UK and US publications, get on the major uh, listings. Features mentioned, brand mentions, whatever it may be, and then we do a uh, a PR syndication campaign combining the digital PR campaign that we do. So so far, so good, mate. Nice, very cool. Uh, Corey says, "Cool package." Thank you. Awesome. So with that, everyone, we thank you. We'll see you uh, in two weeks, not next week, but the week after. Uh, have a good spring break if it's uh, spring break where you are. And don't forget SEO spring training. Last chance if you have any desire to go.